چیز نمیشه something out of it every time I see it. This movie has been, it is the winner of three Golden Globes for Best Picture Comedy, Best Actor Comedy for Colin Farrell, and Best Screenplay. It is the recipient of 10 BAFTA nominations, including Best Picture, Best Director, Lead Actor, Supporting Actress, two for Supporting Actor. It is the recipient of five SAG nominations, leading the way at the SAGs, including, uh, well, lead actor, supporting actress, two for supporting actor, and best cast. Boy, is this the best cast. It is the recipient of nine Oscar nominations, including best picture, best director, Academy Award nominee, lead actor, please welcome Colin Farrell. Or, or in some way, I said, yeah, 
that's no issue. I will do that. I just don't know what further to explore in him. Wow. And uh, so he said, no, I, mean, there would be, I know that, which I obviously won't. Uh, and I just, he, he was dissatisfied with the script as it was at that point. And uh, so then when we got, there was a situation I think he went through in his own life that uh, where he, he kind of was, he had a breakup and uh, he, he went off, he took the script, he was about to abandon it because he just wasn't finding inspiration to make anything that he thought was good enough. I think he was, yeah. And um, yeah, totally. And then, but it, it cut kind of deep and he wrote the new version in 10 days. And when I got it, uh, I just, my heart went up through the roof because there was this involved, sort of layered, enigmatic, busted up sort of character uh, who had, it was just the whole artistic sort of quest was, and I knew it was, it was not manufactured. I knew that he hadn't just summed it up to kind of give the old actor a few good lines. There's nothing about that about it. The exploration was something that I know that he has struggled with in his own life how far the, you, you commit to your, how, how the damage you do, the critical damage of, of seeking artistic expression and creative independence and all that sort of stuff. So so the first time that I really read this, the script was three years ago. And as I say, my, my heart just soared, yeah. Uh, what about Kyle for you, when, when you first read? Was it around that time? And what I preferred the first version. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> my character was cooler. <laughs> and it, was, it was all very, and what Brendan's saying, I, I, I recognise every word, and we've spoken about this before, the first iteration versus what came back to us three years ago when Martin sent the email with what became this film now, the script of this film, we sent the email to Brendan going, hey fellas, I did better work on this, have a look and tell me what you think. But the first version was, was um, it was much more, um, narratively complex, the story points were more twisty and turny, there was a soldier that came from the mainland and kind of I think had an affair with Siobhan or she fell in love with them and there was a big shootout on the beach at the end, I ended up in a rocket chair bleeding out with a gun in my hand, it was amazing, and then I read the other and I was like, oh, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and this one scared me much more, but, but scared in a good way. Do you know what I mean? You you, you want to be a, a little bit afraid of the material. You know, it's the kind of the, the fear is something that's born of uncertainty, and uncertainty is what your curiosity kind of leans into when you go to work. So again, like he said, my heart soared as well. I mean, just the idea of getting to work again with friends and, and Mark, and, and I knew that Kerry was going to be involved and, and stuff. So yeah, it was. I was nervous, but um, excitedly so. What scared you? Um, I just, I, I suppose the fear that you just wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't serve it. You know, you're always, yeah. I think, I mean, you could throw in as well just the fear of the, the, the degrees of exposure, and I suppose somewhere inside, you know, you don't ever want to be confused. Character. <laughs> you, know, you know, when you hear Mark say, I wrote it for you, and then you read, and you're like, Really? Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, I just, look, I have an ego, so there's bits of that, of course. Of course. <laughs> but, but, but do you, you know, it's just, did you want to, it's like what Peter Weir said when he won the, the Governor's Award, Peter Weir got a Lifetime Achievement Award this year, he said, you have to serve the script's ego. It really should never be about the actor's ego or even the director's ego. Um, but you, the script has an ego, and that's what you have to serve, and that's what you're always hoping that you can meet. And Martin McDonough creates such extraordinary um, worlds of such kind of tenderness and violence and hilarity and heartfelt interrelations that you know you just want to rise to meet that. You know, there's no, there's no. Um, you never hear Martin say it's not on the, you know, there's a thing here where you get a little bit of, it's not on the page, you know, it's not on the page, but we'll, you know, or you're trying to elevate something, there's none of that. Martin's script, it's kind of the ones that I've read, that we've read, I think, they're things of perfection. I mean, they're so alive, the page is almost moving as you read it, and so yeah. you just want to do a good job, you know. So, so Brandon, when you were, were talking with Martin, when you were, your, your approach to playing Kyle, did you ever ask Martin, like, okay, I think we've all kind of been there when we don't want to be friends with someone anymore, or 
something that happens to one of us. Like with the fingers, did you ever ask him, like, why is he doing this with his fingers? It is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is. that balance 
to maintain the right tone of this film from start to finish. And what makes Martin such a great actor as director that you were both able to stay on point? Um, oh, I don't know. Uh, Martin demands at least two, or thrice I've worked with him. It was one, two, uh, two week rehearsal, and there's a three week rehearsal in Bruges. Do we do, 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 do close up three weeks in this as well? I think three weeks in this, and it's like, you know, you're in almost a black box theater. You're in a room, there's a coffee machine in the corner, and a few bars of granola, and a couple of tables that get moved around. You sit around and you read the script, and you have a conversation about it, and then bit by bit, you know, you start off with the whole cast there and Martin, and then the next day, certain cast members are called in to read certain scenes and talk about those certain scenes. And there's a process over the three week period of familiarization. Uh, when we started doing the Rouge, I remember saying to Ben, in like three weeks rehearsal for the film, it's going to be like part of a bundle of flogging a dead donkey. You know, we're going to, there's going to be nothing there. <laughs> I knew what was coming from the second act. I wasn't going to not say it just because. But anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, what I realised with Martin is his, his, just like the audience seemed to have uh, a kind of these multitudes of response, and, and they garner very specific personal meanings from the film. Based on people that I've talked to, I realised that same thing as an actor. The more questions you ask of the script, the more questions get revealed. So you're never fully certain exactly what you're doing or what film you're telling. You trust Martin implicitly because he's seen it all. He's heard the music of his writing and dialogue. And so you're kind of trying to step into this kind of world of imagination and make it manifest. And I totally put all my faith in him. He's very detail oriented, but he's also, he's also open to interpretation. And, and more so, the wiser he gets, I think, and the older he gets, the more experience he gets, and the less kind of, the more relaxed he gets in his creative process as a writer director, then the more open he is to the actor's interpretations. Not that he was dictatorial when we did in Bruges, but it literally was more, no, it's this, 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 this. It was a bit more of that, and that was fine. None of us came out badly as a result of the process being more in that direction. But on this, he still has very specific ideas. And, but you'll go away from it and then you'll come back to it and then you'll go away and, and, and you really feel like you're in a sandbox. And yeah, so it does feel a little bit like a, a, a theatre production in a way. You feel like you're part of a very, very collaborative experience. Um, as far as the journey of Warwick, I, I don't know. I mean, I just knew, I knew when I read the script that in its simplest form, just speaking first person perspective, in its simplest form, the story was about um, a man whose who's hope and whose connection to joy and connection to community through friendship, through his love for his sibling, uh, through his adoration and his continuous communion with his animals, all that love by the end of the film is taken from him. So just knowing that and just allowing myself to be guided by the kind of downward spiral of that journey uh, and it was all there on the page. And that was just really you talk about trust, mm -hmm. the trust that you do have in each other, the trust that was established 14 years ago at the Rouge, the trust that you have with Martin, that was also established at various points because you worked with him before you and then you worked with him again after in Bruges. So when it came time for the Banshees, like, do you think that that you were able to to go to another level because you already had that body of work, because you know, for all those years and the friendship that you had, you feel like if you would be Banshees 14 years ago, would it have been a different movie versus the one that you made, you know, this recent? Well, I think the, uh, you know, you know, this the call there, the, the thing that Martin did develop since in Bruges was this ability to write spaces that could be filled by things that, like, for example, even that scene about looking at my finger, where I think he had that as part of, you know, perhaps he feels this, or, but he had left a space for it to be something or maybe something else. And so that takes kind of a, um, he moved into a new area of self-trust in a way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Really yeah. con con confidence in his own yeah. ability to be able to find, he knew, and then sometimes he'd have, uh, that I want an option there. And he, as Colin said, he'd bring it right way around. But in terms of us, like, it, it involves, it's an impossible question to answer, certainly. Uh, it's an impossible question to answer, really, too, because, because of the way we gelled on in Bruce, 
part of what he wanted to explore was the dynamic of saying, well, I guess let's, let's split the two of these up then and see how they get on. <laughs> um, which like, means that, because one of the things that he really wanted to do, like he wanted to be, to serve it properly, to serve in Bruges properly with the next one. And he wanted to get into places, say, where these are characters you hadn't seen these, uh, us, the actors, the cast, do before. He wanted to bring us into new places. So I think he specifically looked at the, the, yes. the bond that was there and then decided, okay, let's make it stop. <laughs> I just got to do it with Leslie Nielsen having a piss in the toilet. Here I see the film. <laughs> 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 So I want to ask you, you know, last year, 2022, uh, after Yang, The Batman, 13 Wives, Banshees of Anishina. Kyle, what a freaking amazing year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was it like for you to go from filming 13 Wives to filming, you know, Banshees? Uh, joy, absolutely just spoiled. Like, really spoiled. Yeah. But, but 
Pat, uh, Pat Shore's art and John Kenny were a kind of a comic duo that bus broke up, which is kind of ironic given the name. Has a, a, had also worked on some of Martin's plays. That's the Barman and the Barfly. And that combination is just, that's, it's just honestly making a cat laugh. And, you know, but it also had a kind of a, we ready to carry the, the moments where there was a like, real kind of madness in the house and real danger in the house. And it, you know, when Barry Keoghan comes in with all that beautiful vulnerability, but also oddness, and he walks in with his stick. And that's, you know, Pat Short is telling him, what is it now? You're barred till April, what's it now? April, he says. It's like, so you, can, you cannot do that without not just buying, but massive talent, and also then a complete commitment to Martin and his work, yeah. and to the whole project. So honestly, this whole thing has been an extraordinary thrill. And we know we're representing all of totally. those, you know. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah because there was no like there was no uh, nobody was inured to the excitement that we all felt embarking on this journey. None of us. We were all I talked about the nervousness beforehand and all we were all nervous, we were all we all held the material kind of something that was very precious and it was just this extraordinary collaboration yeah. together, you know, and we really because we were welcomed into the two islands as well. You know, like I, I feel in a way, this story isn't about island people that we recognise at all. It's but the uh, two islands we shot on in Ishmore and Ackle. I feel like we're representing the people of those islands as well because they brought us into their lives and they brought us into their homes and they worked on the film. So it really was an extraordinary collaborative effort across the board. You know? I'll tell you, just again to go back to Gary. I remember when we were on Ishmore, we were on Ishmore uh, the islands for two weeks first of all, uh, and that was the smallest. A, a smaller of the two islands, so it was a, a totally village, communal feel, and I can still see because and the, the reason I, I love and thanks for the opportunity to, to mention Gary was I can see, I used to come we used to come across each other on various kind of modes of transport, as in bicycles or running or walking or on a horse or something. But uh, Gary and I, and I remember him cycling up and I chatting to him over a while, and before the scenes that were coming up had to be shot. And what he was going through at the time, and what the, the nerves and very the feel, a very lonely place, that's exactly right. And the, so the feeling of being an inch more in a community that had embraced us with what was our community, including crew, including everybody you know involved in the movie, all the cast, all in that place on the one time, that's what the ensemble was. Yeah. By the way, that the location is like a character unto itself uh, that really brings you all together and I mean even down to Jenny and Sammy and I mean it's there and you I kind of had a little hard time working with Jenny and Sammy like there was that a little bit explain of, yourself uh, <laughs> Jenny, Jenny, uh, Jenny gave me one kick it was my fault I got too close to her <laughs> <laughs> that can be an unnerving place at the best of times especially if you don't know what your purpose is <laughs> And I don't think it would have been fair to expect the donkey to know her purpose. Was. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? She did. She just was like, well, you know, you'd hear, see the first assistant director go, <laughs> and everything would get deathly quiet on the set. From the chaos and the pandemonium of a working film set, deathly quiet, and you'd hear, <laughs> and then she'd come, and her trainer would have a few carrots in her, on, her, on her belt, and she'd show Jenny, okay, Jenny, come around, and, and then down there, and then down there, and she'd get it three or four times, and she'd be perfect, and then they'd say, and action, and she fucking... <laughs> <laughs> Searchlight production. No, oh, she just was. So you have to, you know, you have to adapt, and you're in the presence of the honesty of nature. That honestly was a gorgeous. Go, Jenny. Go, Jenny. <laughs> so, watching it for for the fifth time. Yes. And by the way, it's on HBO Max. It is right there. So you got it. Watch it again. Uh, the end of the film. Uh, did you ask Martin what happens? Like, like. Like, what does this mean, or what happens after the says, thanks for watching my dog? Well, <laughs> look, luckily, um, and intuitively, and practically, Martin made it happen that we shot that as pretty much the last scene uh, of the shoot. Yeah, it's great. And uh, <laughs> it 
<laughs> Why do you laugh? <laughs> and then we wouldn't speak to each other ever again. <laughs> but uh, no, no, it was like, uh, it, it just meant we were going, as we said, we had left spaces for alternative uh, takes on various things um, and different kind of ways of going on the same journey. And we weren't ultimately entirely sure. And I know Martin had left it deliberately in a place. There was an alternative ending that we did shoot that had, well, there was a, this part of a scene that was very interesting. I, uh, um, and I don't want to share with you because then people say, yeah, maybe we should come back. <laughs> but I remember I was always talking, you know, in the, at this uh, time afterwards, almost saying, <laughs> Martin had to say, no, remember, we left that out. It was kind of things that were going into the, the kind of, that last scene. And we spent a long time in the yeah, beach. And, yeah, we did, yeah. Perfect day was the last day. Yeah. Perfect. And we found, we we, we found, it was all about small measures of what we knew, we knew what was in the studio. It was the recipe. It was like, how much of this, how little of that. We knew the mix, and then by the time we got there, we had been on the journey of the film. The whole project was coming into this kind of denouement, and it kind of felt, uh, and even at that, uh, there were, all, there were. I remember doing various takes where even the way we look at each other, at each other with the dog was the emphasis on the possibility of hope or lack thereof. It'd be very interesting to see how many people believe there is a there is a modicum of hope at the end or whether chance of reconciliation yeah. or is that the line in the sun yeah. drawn too deep. Were you knackered in the last day? Were you how did you feel? No, I was I could have been there for a fortnight because I just wanted to I just wanted to get that one right. Yeah. And I think we felt going away from it. Whatever it was, it was in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Agrees. The, the, the ambiguity of the ending, uh, my take, uh, is the modicum of the, the, the hope that the movie does end on, is the acceptance that the line has been drawn. Yeah. But it's the acceptance. Right. That's just my take. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the question I have, mm -hmm. last question mm -hmm. is A, how proud are you of the film, of the reaction it's got? B, maybe uh, another. Talk with Martin and Dad about the third film together. Woo! <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I'm so proud to be a part of the film. I mean, I've been acting for, I don't know, 25 years or something like that, and um, I've been blessed beyond all measure um, to be able to just be a working actor. You know, that's the thing. I, I just, to be, able to, to be able to make a living as an actor, like just that alone is a huge thing, and it's a, it's a struggle for so many people as well. So the fact that I'm working after 25 years, it's still a bit magic to me, right? And then the things I've done, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, sometimes you're proud, sometimes you're not. You're always proud of the endeavor. You're always, I've always found great pride in um, being part of the collective that is sharing your life with a bunch of people, whether it's for two or three weeks or eight weeks on location or sometimes up to five or six months. You always have an extraordinary experience. And my last 25 years has been a life in films, a lot of my life. So they mean a lot to me. They meant a lot to me as an audience member to me now, they mean a lot to my kids, you know, and um, so to be part of something is a long way to answer to your question, to be part of something that has had the response that this had, that people have taken into their hearts, especially when I know, as you were saying, Gary, the, the members of the community of both islands, Ackle and Inishmore, the crew Everyone on this, the yeah. cast on this, there was so much heart. Everywhere you looked, people were bringing their own stories. They were bringing their own history to work. And they were sharing stories about their, grand, their grandfathers and Remember Michael Mullen on Inish Moore? Yeah. Uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, one of the best days I ever had on a film. I was sitting on, on the, uh, what's the name of that lovely blue diamond beach that was on Inish Moore, whatever, uh, whatever it was. This beautiful beach of the first island that we shot, not the beach where Collins House was. But um, I was sitting there on the wall one day, a couple of weeks into the shoot. We had about a week left. We shot two weeks, I think we had about a week left on Inish Moor. I was sitting there, the sun was setting. By the way, we had the most unusual summer. In Ireland that, that, that summer. It was just an anomaly. It was like Mykonos. You know, you couldn't find rain. It was unbelievable. And yeah, it was extraordinary. And I was watching the small waves lapping the shoreline, and the sun was setting, and then a van pulled up. And Michael Mullen was his name. And he's kind of like the, the, the unadorned mayor 
of the island. He owns the local shop, he rents the bicycles to the tourists, and on a busy day on Inishmore, there's 750 locals live there all year round. On a busy day, there can be upwards of 2,000 tourists that come on the boat, they spend six hours, they rent a bicycle, they cycle around, they give the bike back to the rental place, they get back on the boat and off they go. So it's two islands. The island during the day, which is kind of chaotic, and all these tourists cycling around and eating sandwiches and looking at point, and, and then it's quiet, it's quite amazing. But I was sitting on this wall, and I heard a van pull up, and pulled up right behind me, and I looked, and this, I don't know, maybe 60, burnt, sunburnt, like a farmer's, uh -huh. like a farmer's tan, shirt open, you can see the white line where the shirt is, and his chest is red, Grey hairs springing, <laughs> hard working man, big back on him, huge hands. There was two rental bicycles, because they don't always, tourists of course being tourists, bring the bicycles back where they should, sometimes they leave them and they walk back. So he does a circuit of the island in his van at night. There was 30 bicycles in the back of his van. He got down off his van, he picked up the bike, and he picked up another bike and put it in his van. And then he went, and he went, oh Jesus, you're that, 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 uh, that actor fella. <laughs> And I knew I'd been told about him. I said, You're Michael. And he goes, Yeah, yeah, Michael. And I shook his hand. And he said, and he, looked, and he just looked out. And I looked at him. He just looked out at the water for about 30 seconds. And it was gorgeous. And he went, Something else, isn't it? Hmm. And then he stayed for 10 minutes. And over that 10 minutes, I think I shared a bit with you. He told me about his father. He told me about the relatives that moved to America and lived their lives there and had kids there. He told me about a relative that came back. He told me about the loss, the losses that his family experienced. <clears throat> that 10 or 15 minutes, I shit you not, was one of the best 10 or 15 minutes I've had in 25 years of making films. It will stay with me forever. I swear to God, just listen to his story. So that's just one example. And that kind of thing wasn't uncommon. People were bringing their hearts to work. So that, honestly, when it comes to the film being received the way it is, it's about all that, you know? I mean, yeah. What's it? It's all interlinked. I just thinking when you were talking there, Ravi Nachtin, who I, you know, I hadn't mentioned as part of the ensemble, who is the 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 postmistress, the, the you know, the, 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 sh the shite news woman. <laughs> but Ravi Nachtin is a Gaelic born, in other words, she she's from that part of the world, so where they they speak Irish, uh, Gaelic, as as the, their mother tongue, as the first tongue, and we got the musicians together, like um, like one of the things that. The investment like was the tune, and I Martin had allowed me to put that tune together and to gather he, he, to gather musicians that I would have known. So I we had these people that I kind of knew too that I, I kind of only met and really Nafton and then after the first two or three weeks of rehearsal, do you remember that? Yeah. We went in and we, we said we put a few things down just to have as a kind of a guide track if we need it, but it was all going to be done live. But we, we put it down as a guide track. And we had, uh, we saw a few tunes in the, in the recording studio, in, uh, and, uh, or in Drew, in the place of rehearsing. And then we went back and had a few tunes with the cast, all the rest of the cast. And Brie Nathan, who was the postmistress, being from that part of the county, do you remember she sang? She sang a couple of old Irish songs in, in, as, in, as baby in Irish that would make you know, just the hair stand in the back of your head, and did make the hair stand in the back of your head. And to have her sitting in there telling you that that's shite news or telling me <laughs> that's shite news and stuff. And just, uh, there was an integration of, yeah. of everything about that, you know. And as Carl said, it's important to understand that this is a make-believe world. Nobody's attempting to say that that's what happens on this island, on this island. Um, it's a world that has been created. But the elements that were there and the feeling community, community I, the great thing about it was, one of the things I'm most proud of, and I'll stop now because I know I'm going on, but like, myself and Carl went in as tremendously sort of close uh, soul buddies, Martin also, uh, and nothing that happened in that, it did anything but to strengthen those bodies. Yes, it's true. And it's so to have that then and to have it presented and travel across the world, where in the Los Angeles way of, of welcoming, uh, and openness, it's been received by people to hear in Venice that even before the subtitle came up, people were roaring laughing and so <laughs> uh, It just means that the local stories do travel. Yeah. That, you know, it just, it brings an awful lot back to us of reaffirmation that, yeah, can't, this is what creating can, can do. And 
Like, it's a credit to the people who go and are open enough to, you know, you won't have caught every word, I bet you. Um, <laughs> but to kind of empathize with what we're doing, the fact that our communication with you guys came off, yeah. and that we were such a together body of people, is, uh, it is one of the, certainly right at the top, the pinnacle of my creative life, for sure. Well, gentlemen, congratulations. Thank you so much.